You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. So for most of the 20th century, there were three big television networks in America. ABC, CBS, and NBC. And in the 1980s, a new network came up on the scene, the Fox Network. Now, one day, executives from the Fox Network approached a writer and illustrator of some comics that were gaining some popularity, and they approached him about making a cartoon for their network, some animated content. Now, initially, he, of course, thought, like, great, I'll make a cartoon version of this popular series that I've developed. But while he was in the lobby waiting for his meeting to pitch the series to executives, he had second thoughts. He thought, this could go south. You know, what if the network doesn't do so well? You know, I don't want to tarnish my brand. And he didn't want to get into the legal copyright issues that could arise when he takes that that printed material and transforms it into a series. So while he was waiting in the lobby for that pitch meeting, he came up with an entirely new concept for a totally different series with different characters. I am talking about one of my all-time favorite cartoons with one of my all-time favorite characters, The Simpsons. And so this episode is going to be about the artistry of Homer Simpson. I feel like who art ed? I'm trying to spice it. Who art ed? Mr. Wood art ed me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me today is my mother, Janet Wood. Thanks for joining me. Oh, you're welcome. Happy to join you. And I wanted you to come on today because we're talking about one of my favorite fictive artists and you know, artwork that was really impactful on me from an early age. Like, I I don't remember exactly when I started watching The Simpsons, but I I feel like it was probably like kindergarten, first grade. I started watching it very, fairly early on. Do you remember? definitely, Definitely young. I don't remember exactly. I don't know that it was quite the most appropriate, um, visual for you, but uh, it was popular in the family. So well, you well, enjoyed it. Was, it. <laughs> it was one of those things where like, I, I don't know the exact age, but I remember I was, I was too young to get all the jokes and get all the references, but I was old enough to appreciate some of it and realize that there were clever things happening that were going over my head. Uh-huh. You know, like I was, I was just intelligent enough to know that I missed the joke. <laughs> There's something going on and you're not tuned in. <laughs> yeah. But it, it was like hugely influential on me. Uh, you know, as, as an artist, I learned to draw by like copying the things I, I saw, drawing my favorite characters. You know, I, I definitely made some, some poor choices and, subjected you to and continue to subject you to those poor choices. Um, but like, do you, re- do you remember when I started drawing on the walls? A little bit. There was definitely sketching <laughs> walls. Yeah. Like as an adult, I, I think back and it's like, it was probably actually like horrifying. Cause you probably heard like scratching sounds <laughs> coming through the walls in the middle of the night. But, Not- um, yeah, but it was funny because my sister said, did you realize, because she stays at my house sometimes, and in the back of the blinds, there's yeah. sketch pencil, and she goes, did you realize there's something there? I said, I don't doubt it, <laughs> or maybe. I think back, like, one of the things I find really interesting is of all the times that I was, like, drawing and painting on the walls, <laughs> your reaction to it. I sort of encourage creativity. I, I didn't, I didn't get mad. You you didn't when I was painting and drawing on the walls. You did, though, when I painted over it. I remember that was one of the only times I remember you saying you were disappointed in me because I painted over it without taking a picture. Without a picture and documenting it. So to me, art was destroyed. <laughs> so it, it's not mad. It's just disappointed that I didn't get to 
save it somehow. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, and so that masterpiece that was lost to the ages, <laughs> do you want to tell our audience, what was it? Oh, uh, you know what? I would suggest, as I recall, that it was a Simpsons little uh, Bart, maybe, or uh, uh, his dad, uh, Homer, not positive. I don't recall exactly, but I'd say Bart. It, it, well, it was, it was, it was a sim, it was like a Simpsons landscape. It had Springfield Elementary. Bart was in there. Homer was in there. Oh. Various scenes from favorite episodes and comic book jokes sort of played out visually in there. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But that provides us the nice segue because this is going to be an episode about one of my favorite shows growing up, an early influence on my art. And I appreciate that you didn't stop that. Well, pretty much you were very creative in your choices of things. I mean, there just anything you could get your hands on was used as a canvas. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I guess we're going to start now with a little bit of the development here, the background. Now, Homer Simpson is, as I said, he's fictive. He's from the popular animated series, The Simpsons. And it's sort of a satirical look at the American family structure and society at large. Um, interestingly, the Simpsons came from the creator, Matt Groening, wanting simp to represent simpleton because like Homer Simpson is basically, um, written as, you know, just the constant fool in the show. Like everything he's doing is, is almost always the wrong choice. There are a few times when he breaks that, you know, for the sort of the tug at the heartstrings and, and, and things like that in the episode. But for the most part, he is the slapstick buffoon. You know, he is the clown of the series. I I like one of the, one of the writers I saw was interviewed saying he wrote for Homer, Homer Simpson thinking, what would a dog say if he could talk? Uh, the show started as, as shorts on the sketch comedy show, The Tracy Ullman Show. This was in the early days of Fox as a network. And so when Graining was first approached to create something for Fox, honestly, he wasn't sure it would go anywhere. So he didn't want to use his best characters because, like, Graining got that meeting. He was called up um, because he had built a, a bit of a name and a reputation for himself with his comic books. Um, he had like this rabbit character that was fairly popular. And initially he was going into, to pitch a series based on that rabbit. Mm -hmm. But as I said, like Fox, the Fox network was new at that time. And he started to get worried, like, okay, if this goes South, if that new network doesn't take off, my popular character is going to be associated with this failed network and there are going to be these legal issues about rights to it and everything like that. So he pitched them the Simpsons instead. Always kind of interesting how sort of the, those spontaneous choices can just, you know, work, work out pretty well, you know, mm-hmm. Absolutely. the Simpsons ran on the Tracy Ullman show for three seasons starting in 87 and it got its own spin off, became its own full show in 89. So yeah, looking at my personal, history with this I would have been like six or so at the time that it started Mm -hmm. yeah um and like I said it's it is still on today it has shattered records it's now been on for over 30 years produced close to 700 episodes as of the the time of this taping video games feature film and the first shots I guess looked really rough because this was Graining's first time making a show and he like i said he didn't think this through from the start so he 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 came up with the entire idea in the lobby waiting to pitch it to the executives and he gave some rough sketches thinking that the animators were going to clean it up but they basically just traced his work and so if you look at the first episodes of the simpsons uh the characters look a little bit rough. The voices are different, but also like just the animation quality is not what it is today. Um, I always like to think of that because, you know, it is this iconic show in, in today's history, but everything has room for growth. You know, it was a learning experience for those involved, even as they're creating something that 
that's been brilliant and lived on and had this legacy. So Homer as a character, when you think of the, the, the name Homer, what do you think it's alluding to? Um, it could be home. Cause that's the first thing I think of is what is, you know, Homer and home. Oh, I, I love that. I hadn't thought about that at all. I, I was thinking of the Greek mythology, Homer, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, but apparently according to graining, you're, you're more correct than I was. Um, <laughs> Because Homer, it's not referencing home, but it is uh, Graining's father is named Homer. And so he basically just wanted to, to name that character in a way that would amuse his dad and also embarrass him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, there's always room for that as a child gets older. Okay? There is room for that <laughs> as, as I'm dragging a parent onto this podcast. <laughs> Oh, you're funny. So, yeah, he it, it wasn't meant to be anything really significant because when I always think of like satire and everything like that, I always think of um I always think of like allegories. I always think like every element is is purposefully chosen to represent something. And and in some cases it is, it, but in a lot of cases it's not. You know, Homer is meant to just be a character who is, you know, pull, pulling out all the flaws of, you know, American middle class life. You know, he's seen as lazy and, and slovenly. And, you know, basically he he just indulges his vices throughout the series. And what I, what I find really interesting, though, is throughout the arc of the series, he takes on numerous jobs and basically is stumbling through life, but accidentally striking opportunity after opportunity, becoming an astronaut, even a stint as a famous artist after he fails at building a backyard barbecue pit. So shall we transition to go over this episode? We're going to be talking about Homer's stint as an artist specifically. And the episode was from season 10, episode 19 entitled mom and pop art. Have you watched it? I did. I did. I enjoyed it. So I always like to start off with just what jumped out to you about it. What was your, your favorite piece of his? What, or least favorite piece? What did you react to? What did you What did you notice? What did you find interesting or thoughtful or insightful? What was your takeaways? Well, I I found it kind of funny that you know everybody was you know he fell into this art serendipitously and you know didn't realize he certainly didn't value it, um, but other people that you might think of as snobby came along and said, oh, this is just fantastic and he's looking at oh you know surprise but then got into the okay I can do more of this but it was very his creations became very uh non-creative in that they were repetitious of of the earlier accidental sculpture and then but but he did go to the art uh it, it became a um uh, common uh, interest of himself with his wife, Marge. So they went to the museum and he started to get some inspiration from, from the artist's work that he saw there. And uh, it was nice that it pulled them together in some ways, but it also made them, uh, on Marge's part, who, who enjoyed art and had been trying so hard to become an artist, um, she was fine, maybe a little jealousy there. Um, but, uh, I, I did enjoy his, his piece. You had to, you know, suspend your animation. I do enjoy, uh, what he based it on the, uh, the artist that does the outdoor installations. Christo. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're pretty spectacular use nature. And, and, uh, so it was interesting what he did in his creation. I enjoyed it. It was pretty funny. I would think most people would get in trouble for it. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 
Well, it is, it is funny because it, it's, um, you know, the, the final piece that he created, the Grand Canals of Springfield, he created by flooding the town. And, and yes, in, in the real world, he would have been arrested for destruction of property, flooding the entire town. Lots of people would have been killed. But in the Simpsons world, where just putting snorkels on the animals is all you got to do to to keep everybody safe and people are happy to just boat around town as their homes are flooded. Um, like it, it worked. It showed, it showed his, his growth and his ingenuity. You know, he learned from that trip to the museum and he applied it in, in a new and unorthodox way. I felt like it was interesting how in that episode there, there is a, a bit of satire and, and, and making fun of a number of different things about the art world. You know, one of the central sorts of conceits of the show and the premise is Marge worked hard. She's, she's an accomplished artist and Homer is just this buffoon. You know, he stumbles into it by failing to make a, a grill and people say, oh, it's, it's this great sculpture. And once those tastemakers, the, the initial, I think, who was the voice? Was it Isabella Rossellini, I want to say? Not positive. But, um, but like once, once, that, that, once the galleries embrace his work, you know, Montgomery Burns is interested in buying the piece and, and everybody is looking at, at him as this great talent. You know, Um, and I I think it is interesting because there is a little bit of truth to that. There is a certain amount of the fact that there are gatekeepers and tastemakers in the art world where, you know, the what was it last year we had at Art Basel in Miami, the comedian piece where he duct taped a a banana to the wall and it it sold for six figures. Um, when you go to the grocery store, you can get the same banana <laughs> for for Watch less me. than a dollar. Um, and and the thing is, like, with a piece like that, even if you love that duct tape banana, it's going to rot. And so part of what you're buying is just the idea of duct taping a banana to it because the person who owns it has to has to keep replenishing it. Just like. Um, you know, with Felix Gonzalez Torres's piece, he would just say like, "Pour 175 pounds of candy on the on the gallery floor, and just passersby can take it." Uh, and I know there's more to the to the idea be, than that, but there is something interesting about this idea being the art. And you know, once it gets that seal of approval, it's like the artist doesn't even have to make anything anymore. Um, it almost becomes secondary. And for a lot of people. You know, in that traditional framework, the way that Marge was, where it's like for her making something beautiful was the art. And I, what I what I find interesting here is there's this tension between is art about those ideas and that innovation and a different way of seeing and experiencing the world, or is art about your craftsmanship skills? And that's the tension that I saw between Homer and Marge. And yes, she did have some jealousy because she had she had worked hard her entire life and didn't get the validation that he did. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of stink. Yeah, like, it'd be like tough. You feel for her. Well, she did get up and was on that roof. She she was painting, that, and she yeah. was happy. And someone enjoyed it because they wanted to uh, abscond with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that's right. Jasper John steals well, it. Oh, you know, <laughs> to a certain extent, someone appreciated that art. <laughs> yeah, but like it, it is just like everything else in in the sitcom world. It's you know wrapped up neatly at the end of the twenty two minutes or whatever the runtime was, and and you know all is resolved. But I, I do find it interesting to think about as a work of art. How was Homer? You know, um, because if we if we take that idea of Homer as an being discovered as an outsider artist, which 
I love the way they they called out how problematic that term is by describing an outsider artist as the work of a hillbilly mental patient or champ- chimpanzee. And like Homer says, like in high school, he was voted most likely to be a mental patient, hillbilly or chimpanzee. Um, but it, it's like, it is so, so demeaning. And, and now the proper term would be a self-taught artist. Um, but as a self-taught artist, Homer was creating some unique sculptures. And with his work, I always think of the common critique that people say like, well, anyone could do that. I could do that. My kid could do that. You know, um, and what's your thought on that? Like the, the anyone could do it kind of. Well, I think, I think everybody has some, something in them that they can create they can whether it be just a still life type of a look which would be you know your maybe your marge kind of a thing but um you know it i guess it would also be like how satisfied or how happy it would make you to make or not make something but i think everybody has has a a, a possibility to be yeah. an artist Absolutely. so so do you feel like the, the, the critique of like, well, you know, he just made this sculpture as a, a pile of junk and refuse, you know, well, anyone could do that. Do you feel like that invalidates the work in some way that it doesn't, sh- it doesn't show an exceptional skill or craftsmanship? Well, he was certainly unique in that particular sculpture. I mean, it was an accident, but I think a lot of things that prove to be actually valuable are accidental, whether it be a scientific uh, discovery, um, you know. And, or and coming up with a, a, an idea for a, an animated series while you're in the lobby waiting to pitch something else. <laughs> there you go. I don't know. You know, I mean, there's, there's so many possibilities in life, whether it's art or something else. Um, I think uh, c- certain people discover they have art in their soul is something happens that they didn't expect to happen and they gave something a try. So I don't know. It depends. And and then whether you're happy just creating that or doing that in yourself is value in itself, whether someone else appreciates it or not. I don't know. You know, I suppose it would be dependent on why you're creating something for your self-satisfaction and just an outlet, or are you trying to, uh, please or impress someone or give someone else joy it depends yeah that's a good point so so really what i'm hearing you say is uh, obviously be open to the spontaneous as as you know i think bob ross was famous for saying the happy accidents you know mm-hmm. recognizing when you stumble onto something good that's an important skill you know being mindful and recognizing that the sort of fortuitous accident and happenstance, but also whether something is prized for like, or whether it's a valid critique of something that like, well, it looks like something anyone could do. It really matters the intention because is that created to impress an audience with the the skill or is that created to express an idea or to satisfy oneself? So like the, the, the artist's purpose yes. really relates to, you know, the, the level of need for polished refined craftsmanship. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Is that well, yeah, I'm, but I, I would was hope trying, you would agree with that. I'm trying to restate was, what you're <laughs> you were saying. I'm checking for understanding. Yeah. And you said it very articulately. I would say that was a good summary. Yeah, so uh, I I think that's interesting. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, because what when I was looking at it, I'm going to be honest. I was just thinking that's ugly. That is terrible <laughs> art. It made me laugh. I, I liked the umbrella popping out at the end as the finishing touch. But, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> He did I was have, just, have emotion in his piece, <laughs> even though he didn't realize he had one. It didn't even feel expressive to me. It didn't like it. Like, you know, she talks about the, the 
key being anger and everything or rage. And it's just like, it didn't even feel like it had those expressive qualities to me. It just, it just felt sort of shambling, you know? A pile um, of punk. <laughs> yeah. Um, like it, it felt more in line to me with like the comedian piece where it's just like a demonstration of what we can get away with. Um, well, his anger was expressed as he was creating it. Whether it showed anger at the end, I would agree. I don't know that yeah. that's what I saw. I just saw a pile of garbage. But, but um, he was definitely expelling his anger as and rage as he <laughs> threw the stuff on the pile. But uh, yeah, calling Homer an artist is yeah. He he's an artist. He's creating stuff. But whether he was any good or not is or whether his art was very good or not is a totally separate matter. And I feel like um, as a character, as Matt Groening's art, Homer is brilliant. You know, um, there, there, it, throughout so many episodes, so many seasons, so many things, there's just layer upon layer of, of insightful satire that's happening that is amusing on the surface level, with the sort of um, slapstick comedy that's happening, but then it gets at these deeper and deeper levels of insight into um, various areas of society that I feel like Homer as a work of art is brilliant as if he were, if it were a performance artist doing all of this stuff that he does throughout the series, I would say he's the most brilliant performance artist I've ever seen in my life as a sculptor. I feel like it's terrible. <laughs> As, as, like the sculptures, the aesthetics, I, I feel like are are not working. I feel like they're not balanced. Um, you know, there's there's little unity to the compositions. They're not expressive. There there are no ideas or emotions really evident in there. Um, you know, but then that final piece. That's where we see he works instead of going off the raw emotion and just hacking his way to create something. What did he do before that final piece? Do you remember? Well, he went to the, he went to the museum and he fell asleep and dreamed a lot of things that, uh, you know, were a lot uh, of art inside I'll jokes, you no, know? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but I think the, the key point there is you said he went to the museum and he took in various works of art from various artists and various styles. And to me, the takeaway from this piece is largely about the, the creative process because the creative process, so many people have that idea of that solo artist with this vision operating sort of outside of the bounds of society. They're, in, they're this isolated genius in a vacuum and they come up with this inspiration. But actually operating on pure instinct is where he failed. The, the creative process is largely about research, finding out what other people have done, figuring out what worked from those things, and then putting your own different spin on it. And so... You know, he learned from Christo and Jean-Claude. He learned from Turner. He learned from all those different artists. And he created his masterpiece, The Grand Canals of Springfield. Which, again, if you forget about the fact that it would have killed so many people and leveled the town. He brought a lot of joy to people. And it he was... He did. It was... I, it, you know, it was the I, happiest he, I've ever seen Millhouse. Yes. <laughs> he surprised himself in the town. Um, and I, I feel like that was something that what I like about that as a work of art, the intention behind it was positive. And the effect in that world was positive. It was a touch of whimsy, you know, that everyone could enjoy and everyone could be a part of. And I love the fact that he broke out of the gallery world and made his art democratic and an experience that everybody could enjoy and connect to. 
You got you got anything else you want to say about his work? <laughs> I don't know. Like I say, I enjoyed it. I thought it was funny. I mean, Simpsons were not my particular thing, but uh, uh, you know, it it has its moments that I enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, you know, it was it was it was a good piece at the end, as you say, and I and it brought a lot of joy to everybody. But uh, and I'm wrapping it up. I want just a three point rating scale. And where should this hang? The Lou, is this something to look at? The lab, the lab, is this something to learn from? Or the Lou? British for the bathroom. Yeah, there's a the poop joke in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, I don't like this kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't judge. <laughs> I think it's fun. It was, you know, it was enjoyable to watch. That kind of stuff. I, you know, I mean, yeah, you can learn something from it. I don't know that it's, you know, something that you have to remember for your whole life. I mean, you can take a, you can take a, uh, obviously a thought from it as we've discussed. I mean, what is our, why, how does it develop, you know, from what does it develop? That's that thing. That's a, that's, that's a, a Louvre kind of a moment, you know. Um, there's nothing terrible about it in that, you know, like, uh, learn, you know, you've got a terrible thing and you have to learn from that. And I don't think it's throw out. So I'd probably put it in the top if you had to <laughs> throw it somewhere, but I don't know if it's that earth shattering. <laughs> I think, yeah. um, I actually, I actually would say it's a museum piece. I feel like well, it is a museum piece for, they, for a number of reasons. Okay. Um, everything you just said, I would agree with. It's enjoyable to look at. Museums should have stuff that's enjoyable to look at. You know, I think that's one criterion for for a good museum piece is that we can. But you also said there are multiple ways you can connect to it. It poses different questions. There are layers of meaning to it. And the fact that it is about the art world, I feel like also would be beneficial to people who are going through a museum because it primes you to think about and make sense of other works of art. And finally, I, I think, you know, I I've said this before so many times, museums don't need to have things that are earth shattering. You know, in a, in a lot of ways, this is a, a very true reflection of our culture there are a lot of things that are that are relevant to our culture. I, I feel like pop culture is easily dismissed, but it is what people relate to the most. That's why pop art is so popular um, and has been for decades now is because it is the common culture. It is art in the vernacular that everybody can understand. And that's why we're starting to see video games in, you know, like the MCA. We're seeing, you know, cartoons and other things like that being viewed through that critical lens because they do tell us something about the society and the culture that created them. And I mm-hmm. feel like this is a brilliant example from, again, one of the longest running scripted series in American history. It deserves some respect. Not Very every episode's been the best, you know, certainly, but it's it's something worth worth seeing and appreciating. There you go. Uh, agreed. So thank you so much for taking the time to join me and talk, reminisce a little bit about, you know, the horrors I inflicted upon you and our home in my childhood. Oh, uh, <laughs> you did not, you know, but I enjoyed, I enjoyed visiting with you today and, and uh, sharing this time. It was fun. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted. If you found this tolerable, please like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week in the show notes on Twitter at WoodArtEd and on the website whoartedpodcast.com podcast done.